you shall be my witnesses. Powerful words from Jesus to you and to me. My grandfather witness was a witness to things that I never saw. And as a child, I thought that was pretty cool. Grandpa could tell me from his logging days about trees in the Pacific Northwest that he logged so large that eight or ten men could stand with their arms outstretched and they still wouldn't be around the tree. The old growth timber that was no longer there when I was a boy. Grandpa could bear witness to standing at his mom and dad's side as a boy and watching Indians file through the woods. Well, there were no Indians when I was a boy, so I had to believe Grandpa. Grandpa could bear witness to the Columbia River, which is this massive river where I'm from, being completely frozen over, strong enough so that you could take an ox cart and drive it across the ice. And to me as a little boy, I thought, not only is the ice cool, but what's an ox cart? <laughs> Things that no longer existed when I was a child. Grandpa could tell me stories about how the Cowieman River, when he was a young man, was so full of salmon returning in the fall that from one side to the other, it was just a sea of fish. Things that didn't exist when I was a boy. But Grandpa's witness to me of things he had seen made me aware of realities and possibilities that I never would have thought of. Trees bigger, winters colder, things that I was not witness to myself. And, and witness is one of those things that can plant an idea in the heart of someone else. You and I, if we're watching, and if we have been reading the books of Daniel and Revelation, Matthew chapter 24, we're aware that this world is just about finished. And we, we do say amen because we realize that what comes next is better than what is. That Jesus is about to return, and there's just a little bit of time between today and seeing him coming in clouds of glory. Now, in between now and then, you have a very special role. And that's what I want to talk with you about today, because sometimes we wonder, hey, as the world falls apart, whether we're watching the storms of people versus people in Portland, Oregon, or the storm that's turning out in the Gulf, or the storm of nations in Afghanistan or elsewhere, we wonder, what's my role? What's my part? What do I do as this world wraps up just before Jesus comes? And I'm here to tell you that you have a beautiful role. You have a very simple, elegant role and it's something that you can do, and it has to do with your experience with God. Amen. Now, my grandfather was a witness, as I said, to many things that I never saw. And for years, I thought, Grandpa's got all the stories. He's the one that has everything to talk about. But then I turned 21, and all of a sudden, I had something to talk about. Because I was at summer camp, and as some of you know, I was a second-year engineering major at Walla Walla University. And I was watching these summer camp people. It was my first year as a camp counselor with all these screaming kids, which were awesome. And we had this youth minister, and I thought, man, he's having an incredible impact on these young people's lives. And I said a little prayer to myself inside my own head. I said, God, if you want me to be a pastor instead of an electrical engineer, ask me to speak somewhere, and I will know that that's you, and I'll go be a pastor. Now, I wasn't really sure if God still answered prayers like he did in Scripture. I, I was pretty sure he existed, but I thought that was a safe prayer because if something like that happened, not only would it validate his existence to me as a 21-year-old, but it would also call me to something greater than what I was doing. So it scared me to death the next day when Dave Shasky, the camp director, stopped me as I was walking across camp and said, Joe, the pastor at the local church is sick. Will you come speak for us this weekend? And I just about fell over in the middle of camp. Because I had said a prayer in the silence of my own mind, and all of a sudden the king of the universe was saying, I got you. I heard you, and I'll take you. If you want to be a pastor instead of an electrical engineer, let's do this. I looked at Dave, and I said no because I was so scared. I was, a, I was afraid for 42 different reasons, and it's a whole long journey. It's a different story that we can, I can tell you someday to get me back into this pulpit here, this journey. 
But now I have something to share with you, don't I? When I can say that God hears prayers. He loves to answer them. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is wait or later. But the power of someone telling you something they've experienced is incredible. It plants seeds in your mind and in your heart. You start to ask questions like, really? Could it be that there is a God, that he does listen to our prayers, that he wants to answer them, that he might answer them very quickly? And a witness becomes an incredible pull or attraction toward God when we do it. Acts 1, 8 and 9. You see this? It was the scripture reading. Thank you so much for reading that. Well, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and Bradenton. I know that's not there. And to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Jesus is leaving the earth, but he leaves and he says, you all go and you just talk to everybody you see about what you've seen and heard of me. I don't need to send you to seminary. I don't need to send you to school for years. I want you to just go tell your circle of influence what you experienced when you were with me. Hallelujah. Pretty simple stuff. Here's what Jesus did for me. Here's what I heard Jesus say. Here's what I saw Jesus do. So he sends them out. Now notice he says you'll be my witnesses. And I think there's a couple of things that we as Christians can really mess up nowadays. Because sometimes what we think is he said, you'll be my lawyers. And we go out and we want to argue with everybody about what's right and what's not right and what the way they should be living. But he didn't say you're my lawyers. He said you're my witnesses. Tell them what you saw of me, what you heard me say, not what you think. So we're not his lawyers. And he didn't say you'll be my judges. Boy, some of you, if you grew up in churches like I did, it was all about the judging you're doing this wrong. This is not what you wear or eat or drink or think. But friends, we're not his judges. We're his witnesses. Again, the subject is what he did and what he said and what he's planning. Not what I think and not how I think you should live, certainly. And not you'll be my interpreters, especially interpreters of my scripture. Christianity today is getting itself in hot water because we're drifting away from the Word of God because we want to take Scripture apart and say, this is inspired and this is not. This is literal history and this is not. And so we get ourselves in trouble as his followers when we think what he actually said was, you're the interpreters of Scripture. But that's not what he told us. Again, he said, you're my witnesses. What he said, what he wants, what he plans. If we aren't quite sure of what a witness is, Let's listen to John, the beloved disciple who walked with Jesus for three and a half years, who then later on in life is thrown into this remote island of Patmos, and here's God again. Listen to what John says as he's writing in 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Who's he talking about? That's Jesus. This is John saying, I want to tell you what I saw and heard and experienced. Verse 2, the life was manifested. We have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you so that what? Your joy may be full. Could the world use a little joy? It's a mess right now. Uh, whatever news program you're watching, the world is falling apart, and it's falling apart precisely because the world has uninvited God, and God is a gentleman, and when you uninvite him, he says, your will be done. And as we see the Spirit of God being withdrawn, selfish hearts turn against each other. So individuals and nations begin to seek their own self-interest, and it always results in strife, war, and bloodshed. But John is here, and he's saying, I'm going to tell you these things so your joy can be full, even in the middle of all this mess. But notice what he says here, verse 1, when he says, we have heard and we have seen with our eyes. And then verse 2, he repeats it, we've seen. 
verse 3, we have seen and heard. Friends, what is he doing? He's simply telling his experience. He's simply sharing what he lived. That's a witness. Some of us have long years of witnessing. If we're like Victoria, it's more than two. Some of us are just babies. We're just starting out with Jesus, and we're not, we're not quite sure of everything he, he has in store, and we're not really sure of what his plans are for us, but we see enough that we're attracted to him. In either case, we have the beginning of witnesses, witness stories. Let's look at three little examples in Scripture where Jesus says, go and tell, because it's all about the witness. The first one is to John's disciples. Not John the Beloved, but John the Baptist. And do you remember that there was this popular idea of the Messiah at the time? People understood that Daniel's prophecy concerning the Messiah was up. The time was ripe for the appearance of the Messiah. And the Messiah, this uh, term that means the anointed one, he had been built, up, built up pretty big. What was the Messiah expected to do for the Jewish people at this time? What did they think? He's going to go to war for us. He's going to free us from the Romans. He's going to be a political figure. He's going to be a military hero. And we will have our time at the top. But Jesus isn't doing any of that, is he? He's not not climbing the political ladders. He's not out training with the soldiers. What's he doing? He's being a good doctor. He's going around and he's healing everybody. And he's being, a, he's being a good teacher. He's talking to them about the Bible and God and the kingdom of heaven. And he's just not fitting the picture of this Messiah. So John sends his disciples, and he sends them with a question. Hey, are you really the Messiah, or are we supposed to look for somebody else? And listen to what Jesus tells them as he's leaving, as they're coming with this question. Jesus answers, and he says to them, and we're reading Luke seven twenty two. Go and tell John the things that you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. The dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Friends, if you had been there on that day and seen these things, do you think the crowd that was gathered there was like a really boring crowd? If people were coming who hadn't walked in decades, and all of a sudden they're experiencing perfect health, what do you think they're doing? They're rejoicing. They're praising God. They're jumping up and down. They're dancing from one foot to the other foot and back again. And if you're a blind person who has seen nothing for years, and all of a sudden you're seeing full color, panoramic, 3D, do you think you're quiet? Oh, my goodness, you're talking about bugs and birds and leaves and people and the color of clothes. And and, and what if you come there and you've you've been a leper And you have had no friends and no associations for years. And all of a sudden, you're clean. You're in there mingling, and you're bumping people on purpose, and you're hugging, and you're fist bumping. You are, it's an active crowd, and they're excited, and they are praising the Messiah. So Jesus tells these people with questions, go back to John and tell them what you've seen. Take all this wonderful chaos and go tell John. The Messiah isn't what you thought. He's better. But they're supposed to go back and they're supposed to bear witness to what they heard and what they saw. Do you think John's heart might have been filled with joy when he recognized that the order of Jesus, even the order that he told them, is a prophecy from the book of Isaiah? That this is what the Messiah is going to do when he comes. I am betting that that witness filled John's heart with joy. It is the Messiah, and we've been wrong in how we described him, and our preconceived ideas have blinded us to the reality of something even better. It depended on their witness. Here's a second instance. The demoniac. We never learn his name, which is interesting. So often, we just know who they were, but we don't know who they are. It's almost like witness protection. God doesn't doesn't reveal their horrible past. He doesn't associate it. So even if we met this person in the kingdom and he said, hi, my name's Bob, we'd be like, hi, Bob, and we would have no clue that he's a demoniac. His horrible decision-making and all the trouble that he got himself into, we wouldn't know. 
because God protects us. But the story, the account, the historical account is that he lives on the opposite side of the lake where Jesus is ministering. There's no way he's going to get from where he is to where Jesus is. So what does Jesus do? Hey, disciples, we're going on a little boat cruise. We're going to go sailing. But when Jesus goes somewhere, it's always with intent, isn't it? Because he goes straight to where this person is. Now, this person has been, the, the scriptures record, they've been out there for so long and in such a condition, they're running around with no clothes on, they're cutting themselves with stones and chains, they're breaking free of the bonds. Do you think that gets you many Facebook friends? There aren't too many people that are hanging out with you on a Sabbath. You're not getting invited to potluck or over to friends' houses. You're solitary, you're alone, and you're desperate. And then here, comes, then here comes Jesus. And all the disciples and Jesus pile out of the boat. And this person comes screaming out of the graveyards. And all the brave disciples do what? All the brave disciples, including sword-packing Peter, take off down the beach. Because that's what we do. We run. And they turn around at some point and they realize, wait, Jesus isn't with us. Oh, oops. We left the master. Well, hopefully he's okay. And they turn around, and there's the demoniac in his right mind praising God. They clothe him. He's got a whole story, and he wants to stay with Jesus. He wants to be with the one who saved him. And I'll tell you what, isn't that a great thing to do? Hey, Jesus, just keep me right here. Let me go learn from you. I will, I'll study everything you have to say. But here's the crazy thing. Listen to what Jesus tells him. Jesus and the disciples, it's interesting. They turn around when the townspeople ask, because the same instances where the townspeople are like, hey, please go away. And Jesus always goes away when we ask. Okay, I'll go. So he gets back in the boat, and this former demoniac is begging him to go. Let me go with you. But listen, listen to what Jesus says. However, Jesus did not permit him, Mark 5, 19. But he said to him, go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Isn't that a witness? Again, we're not sending you off to college, young man. We're not going to spend years preparing you to tell what happened. Just go home. Your story's enough. Your witness to your circle of friends is even more than what I, Jesus, can do in this moment. You take your story, you tell them what God did for you. You'll be good. Friends, the power of witness cannot be underestimated. You have one trust in friends that I will never be able to get into as a pastor. You've walked for decades with people in your family and in your circle of influence. You've been, you've been honest with people and there are, there are relationships built so that when you say, hey, guess what I experienced with God? They listen to you. And those little things that you tell them, much like my grandfather could tell me of realities that I had never seen, and because he was an honest man, I, I trusted him. When you share realities that they've never seen, They'll trust you. And the Holy Spirit will use your experience to start building a personal relationship in their life with God as well. Third and last illustration. Taken from the end of Jesus' time here on earth. You know, that, that final weekend for Jesus had not gone so well. The rulers of his people reject him. They turn him over to the Roman authorities. And what do the Roman authorities do with him? He's crucified outside the city on a cross. The character of God and the character of Satan fully revealed at one point in history. If you're ever looking to see what God is like and what Satan is like, go to Calvary. Because there's the creator who has spent three and a half years just healing and restoring and giving laughter and happiness. And here's the enemy of mankind nailing him to a cross, hoping that he'll give up on humanity. And God is there with his arms open wide saying, no way. No way. I will be true to my father. I will stay on this tree. And I will love these people to the end. 
And you see, here's Satan revealed as a murderer, and his entire plan, if any of the entire created universe has ever wondered what his plans are, there they are. I will kill God, and I will replace him. And if we've ever wondered what God is like, we see him being consistent in love to the very end. A love for you and for me. So Friday ends poorly, and again the disciples are broken. They run and hide. They're, they're in this, this room, and they've got the door closed, and it's been a horrible weekend for them. But early Sunday morning, Mary and Mary, the two Marys, they decide we're going to the tomb. Maybe there's something we can do for the master. Maybe, maybe we can make this, this burial a little more proper. And they go because they love him. But they get to the tomb, and, and the tomb is surprisingly not full. Jesus is missing. And a young man is sitting there, and he basically tells them, hey, go, Jesus is risen. And as they're going, they encounter Jesus, and Jesus has something important to tell them. Matthew 28, 10, Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Friends, why does Jesus start with that? Do not be afraid. You know, we've heard that phrase before, and this last week it connected with me that we've heard this in the book of Genesis before. The story of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph, if you don't remember this story, was so disliked by his 11 brothers, they drop him in a pit and sell him as a slave, and they never think about it again. He ends up becoming second in command in the most powerful nation in the world at that time, Egypt. And years later, his brothers during a famine have to come for food. You remember the account. And in the course of events, Joseph reveals himself to his brother, and there's a family reunion. But then dad dies. And what do you think the brothers might be thinking? Once their father is out of the way, and it's just the most powerful person on planet Earth and them, what do you think they might be thinking? We're toast. We're done. Now that dad's out of the way and it's just, our, just us, he's going to pay us back for what we did to him. But if you look at the account at the end of Genesis, you'll see, you'll see Joseph saying, he starts with, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm not here for retribution. I was here to save lives. I'm not against you. I'm for you. And when I heard this, this phrase, do not be afraid after this major event, I thought to myself, for the first time, these disciples might be wondering what their master is thinking of them because on Friday they all turned their backs and ran. They deserted the master. They might be wondering what's going to happen now that he's back. And so it amazes me that he says with all the gentleness of Joseph, don't be afraid. I'm for you, not against you. Right? I'm, I'm back alive to give you life. This isn't about revenge. And I, I know you guys ran, but it's okay. Because now I want you to run somewhere again. He says, go and tell my brother and go to Galilee. And there, they will see me. Again, go and tell your witness to people who are fearful and sorrowing is going to change their lives. Do you think that there are fearful and sorrowing people in the world right now? They're watching the same news you and I are, but they don't have the same hope that we do. The hope that there's a loving God who wants good things for us and who has a plan to fix this world once it all falls apart. You and I know from Daniel, Revelation, Matthew, that things do get worse before they get better. As God withdraws His Holy Spirit from trying to appeal to mankind, mankind just turns selfishly against itself, and the world implodes before Jesus returns. But there are sincere people out there right now, and they're wondering if there's a God, and is He trustworthy, and is He good? Does He listen? And they will hear your experience with God and they'll praise him for it. Their joy will be full. So we want to go and tell them so that 
in this little crazy news cycle, their heart can start beating again. That they can find the hope that you have in Jesus. That they can understand that he does listen to prayers and he does answer and he wants to be involved and, and he has a plan to fix it. Your witness is what God will use for that. The unbelieving world needs to hear us say, I've seen, I have heard, I know. I've experienced and God exists and he's good and he's trustworthy. Friends, whether you're new in your walk with Jesus or you've been walking with Jesus for many years, there are different witnesses that you have. First of all, we have their witness. We have, and I almost picked up my phone or my Bible. It's down there, the electronic version of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, we have a witness of the goodness of God. Even though you reject me, God says, I'm sticking here. And I'm going to try to reveal my heart of love and compassion for you. And I'm certainly going to work through my servants, the prophets, to tell you what I'm going to do in advance. So that when you see it, you'll believe. Then we have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These beautiful four accounts of Jesus and what God looks like like. You ever wonder what God is like? Please return to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you have any question about what God is like, go watch Jesus just bring laughter to people and happiness and restore life and health. Watch him heal and and try to listen in. I know sometimes we read scripture, but we don't listen to scripture. And when I say listen, I mean imagine what it would sound like for a city to have no sick people in it because Jesus was there all night healing. Imagine what a crowd of 5,000 people stuffed full of fish and loaves because Jesus just sent all the lunch he just served. Imagine what they would sound like. Listen, because everywhere Jesus goes, there's laughter and there's healing and there's delight and there's happiness. So we have all of that, their witness, but then you have our witness. My, my little experience when I was 21, and I have more. Some of you have heard some of them. But to say a prayer as a 21-year-old person, and God, if you're out there and you want me to be a pastor, ask me to speak somewhere, and then to have that exact same thing happen the next day, yeah, it might just scare you to death like it did me. It might. And if I look back on my younger self, I'd go back and I'd have a conversation. I'd say, look, if God actually talks to you like that, Just He knows your weaknesses. He knows your flaws. You don't have to be scared to death. Just say, awesome, thank you, yes, I'll do it, but help me. Don't do do what I did, which is run away for 13 years. There's a whole story there, too. But we have our witness and our experience that our friends will trust us. They'll say, really? Could it be? Is that so? Is it possible? What would be some next steps? So for those of you just beginning your walk with Jesus, you found out he's an incredible God, you're just learning about him, and you're starting to get into Scripture a little bit, I would encourage you to start asking him for things. Not the selfish things, not like, God, I need a new Escalade, right? Not that kind of asking, but the asking for things that you truly need, the help in overcoming habits, the help in overcoming behaviors, help in times of need help for other people. Help for things from the physical to the spiritual to the mental, from the local here in Bradenton to the global, wherever. Because God is a global God, isn't he? He sends angels all over this world. Matthew 7, 7, you remember that Jesus talks about ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will what? Be open. Sometimes I don't think we ask God, and and I do think that God often works in, in a way that he says, look, when they ask me for permission, or when they ask me for help, I have permission to go do it. Because there's two sides to this, right? There's there's this rebellious angel and all of his followers, and then there's Jesus and all of his followers. And I think sometimes the rules almost work like, hey, I can go do that for this person because they asked me to come do it. They've chosen me, so now I'm gonna go help. And James 4, 2 helps flesh out that picture a little bit when it says, you have not because you ask not. 
the help that we could have, the miracle stories that we could have, the intervention that we could be talking about sometimes never happens simply because we don't talk to dad. We don't treat him like he's real. We don't ask for help. I've got a smaller answer to prayer this week you'll laugh at, but it's, it's big for me. I've had this cold for like four months. Not four months, four weeks, which is one month. And it just hung in and hung in and hung in and hung in. And this week I got, I finally realized I've never once asked God to help me with my cold. So I said, God, could you please take away these sinus symptoms I've been having for, for this long? Thank you so much. Trisha, my wife, says to be sure, it's, tell you it's not COVID because we got tested several times. It was just a bad cold. And then that evening, the day goes by, and by that evening, there were no more symptoms. Small things, but things that, that reveal a loving father who wants to help out. Do we ask him for things? So ask him. If you're just beginning your journey, because this is what begins to build up that little book of remembrance you're going to have about God did this for me, and God helped me with that, and God helped my friend with this when I prayed. And remember those times that he helped and go tell somebody. Share them. Friends, you have stories of God's intervention in your life that I've never heard. And this church is full of accounts of how God has stepped in in the decades past to help in your life. We need to share those stories. They encourage us. They give us a more complete picture of God's love for us and his care. Now, for those of you that are further along in your relationship, you've been walking with God for decades. You've been praying since the time you were knee-high to a grasshopper. I'm going to ask you to ask him for help remembering those things. Sometimes we treat them as if they're common and we think, I'll remember that, and then life happens and all of a sudden they're buried in a bunch of memories. I've recently asked my mom and dad to write down their miracle stories, and I'm still deciphering my dad's handwriting right? Story after story after story of where, where God stepped in, sometimes even unasked, to preserve life, to help with situations, but the outcomes were so miraculous, there's no other explanation. So I would ask for those of you with those decades, ask him for help remembering your experiences with him. And then the same, remember those times that he helped you and tell someone about them. Acts 1.8 again. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. And to where? The ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. Now you and I have arrived at the end of time. We know that. It's not that long before Jesus returns. Praise the Lord for that. We've arrived at the end of time, and we are here in Bradenton, Florida, which is a long ways away from where Peter and James and John shared their stories. We get to share our accounts in this community with our friends in our circle of influence. The next verse says what? He said this, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Now we know that when he returns, how does he return? In a cloud, the exact same way. Because the next verse is, there's this couple of angels that talk to them, and he says, hey, why are you guys standing there looking up? I would have been looking up too, right? But the angels are like, what are you doing? He's going to return in the same way you saw him leave. Mm -hmm. Friends, I want you to share your experiences with other people so that when Jesus returns in clouds, you are pleasantly surprised, and I am pleasantly surprised, to find people in the kingdom whose journey started because of your sharing. Your witness of your experience started a chain of thinking, a chain of events in their mind that when they unpacked it, led them to begin a journey with a God who truly cares. Amen. I invite you to share your accounts and your circle of influence. Because here at the end of time, your witness is one of God's greatest, greatest treasures.
to transform lives.